We're in 1 Kings, and this chapter, chapter 6, and the next one, are all about building God's temple. So we're going to take considerable time with it because so many principles and challenging issues just pop out of the woodwork as we examine this important section of Holy Scripture. Now we took a little detour to end last week's lesson, and we're going to take a few more tonight, that discussed the issue, very important issue, of Bible chronology and how the reigns of kings, both Hebrew kings and Gentile kings, played the central role in determining the dates concerning most biblical events that, see, that we see quoted in the Bible or in textbooks. And this is because, well, oftentimes we'll see the day and the month of an event recorded in the Bible, we don't get a date that quotes a calendar year. And if we do get a year, it's always a year that's in relation to the reign of some king or another. The first year of a king, the tenth year of king so-and-so. That's how it's always given to us. There were five standard protocols used in the ancient days to define the length of the reign of a king. And the scholarly names, obviously they didn't use these names back then, but the scholarly names today were the regnal year, the accession year, the post-dating year, the non-accession year, and co-regency. You can review last week's lesson if you want to know about all these protocols. And it's nearly impossible for us, in most cases, to know which of these methods is being used to report the reign of a particular king in the Bible, but we can be sure that all five methods are mixed in there somewhere. The bottom line was, we shouldn't get too rigid. We shouldn't have intense and divisive arguments over dates and calendars of ancient times, because much of it involves speculation and guesswork, even if it's an educated guess. However, much of the problem we have today of getting it right it lies on the Gentile side of the equation. Gentiles have for centuries wanted to approach the Bible as though the Hebrew culture in which it was written could just be ignored. And thus, we not bothered to consult ancient Hebrew re records or ask learned Jews about calendar and chronology issues, most of which they well understand. Modern Christians and Messianic have great interest in Bible chronology and the order of the things that happened, and it is quite helpful if we can get a good idea of the timing of, of some of these important events. Fortunately, as the books of the Old Testament roll by, and as we enter the time of the kings of Israel, which is where we are now, we can get the accuracy into a pretty narrow range of probably five years, plus or minus a little bit. Now we're going to delve into a few more calendar and dating issues as we proceed, and I think you're going to find this information useful for all of your Bible study and for helping to establish context. Now as we began, here we go. As we began 1 Kings chapter 6, we're told of the commencement of the construction of the temple. Now we're going to go over the construction of it in some detail. It's recorded that it was in the 480th year after the people, in Hebrew the Am, in left Egypt that the construction of it began. We're also told that it happened in the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, we're even given the month of Ziv to narrow it down a little bit. And as we discussed last week, exactly what constitutes the beginning of the construction, that's not really known. And even though near the end of this chapter it says that the foundation was laid in the month of Ziv, which is the second month of the year, in the fourth year 
of Solomon's reign, it is hard to understand just what that means because there's no way that the large limestone blocks that um, were quarried and delivered to the site, the foundation dug, the stones put in place all in a month. Nonetheless, the second month of the Jewish year, in the fourth year of King Solomon's reign, is considered a kind of ceremonial commencement date for the building of the first temple. So that's what we're going to work from. Now the month of Ziv is the same as the month of Iyar. Ziv is the name for this month used by Israel before they were exiled to Babylon. After their exile, they adopted the Babylonian names for the month of the year. Ziv is Hebrew, Iyar is Babylonian, or technically Chaldean. And it's equivalent to about our May-June time frame. Ziv means brilliance, means splendor. And it's an apt name because it's a springtime month with the bursting forth of flowers and crops, and it's the birth of new life throughout the animal kingdom. Now, if we assume that Solomon's reign started in 971 BC, that's a generally accepted date, plus or minus a couple of years, and we believe the scriptures that in the fourth year of his reign, the construction of the temple began, then we can assign an approximate date of 967 BC that the foundation for the first temple was laid. And if we then accept that the statement, accept the statement that the, the, the start date was 480 years after they left Egypt, then we can date the Exodus going back to 1459 BC. But is that correct? Most modern Bible scholars don't accept that. They choose to put the Exodus around 1250 BC, which I think is much, much, much too late. Now let me explain something. This is going to get technical, I, but just hang in there. I want to tell you about some Bible chronology issues that I haven't talked about in a long time. Now it's commonly said among Bible scholars that the calendar used in the Bible is the Jewish or the Hebrew or the biblical calendar and that it is a lunar based calendar. A lunar month is 29 and a half days. That's one full cycle of the moon. And so if one assumes a 12 month year, then 12 times 29 and a half, trust me I did the math, is 354 days. And of course today we calculate a year correctly at 365 and a quarter days. So the standard statement given is, well, the Bible year is shorter than a modern year by 11 days. And so when the Bible gives us some number of years, you see, we have to adjust by assuming fewer years in our modern terms than what's stated in the Bible. So for instance, if the Bible says a hundred years, then they're talking about 35,400 uh, 35, days, a hundred times 354 days, not 36,500 days, a hundred day, days, times 365 days. So by modern calendars then, the logic goes, 100 biblical years amounts to only 97 modern years. So in our case, since the Bible says it's 480 years since the Exodus, then that's really only 466 years according to our modern calendars. Here's the issue. 365 days is a solar year, the sun. It's a solar year. It has nothing to do with counting lunar cycles, cycles of the moon. It's completely independent of it. A solar year is the time measured in days that it takes for the Earth to orbit the Sun one complete time. And as I said, 
a lunar year then, using, using uh, the moon to count, is simply 12 months of 29 and one half day lunar cycles, moon cycles, that adds up to 354 days. So in modern times, the reality is we don't consider the moon cycles whatsoever in calculating a year. It's all based on the sun. We don't even use lunar cycles anymore to calculate the length of a month. Now up through Christ's era, Months alternated in their length in that one month was 29 days, then the next month was 30 days, then back to 29, then 30, and then it repeats throughout the year. Why would you do it that way? Because it's not possible to have a month consist of 29 full days plus a half a day. Pretty hard to have a calendar of 29 and a half days, right? That would have us changing months halfway through a day. Doesn't work. So by having one month at 29, the next month at 30, you'll wind up with an average of 29 and a half. That's not perfect, but it works. And this was done because up to this point in history, one month was defined as one cycle of the moon. Those two things met perfectly. One meant the other. One cycle of the moon equals one month. Therefore, the first day of each month was a new moon. And exactly halfway through, every month was a full moon. It never changed. But in 45 BC, Julius Caesar decreed that the Roman Empire would adopt a new universal calendar. It would be based not on lunar cycles, but on sun cycles. The lunar cycle would not play any more role in determining months or years. Part of the reason for this was that the Romans were sun worshipers. They worship the sun as their god. While most other cultures during that era were moon worshipers. So it made sense to them that ordering their year based on the movement of their god through the sky, the sun, was the right thing to do. Plus the fact it worked. So the idea, while the idea of dividing a year into 12 months was retained by Caesar. Under the Roman system, months then were assigned differing numbers of days, like we see it on our calendars now. Why do we have days that are 28, 29, 30, and 31 days? Because it all adds up to 365, one sun cycle. That's how we get there. Here's the fallacy. The so-called Jewish or biblical calendar is not based solely on moon cycles, as some Bible scholars claim. It's not so. These ancient people weren't ignorant. They understood the movement of the sun and understood that a year was longer than 12 lunar months. It was longer than 354 days. They understood that a solar year was 365 days. So they regularly added extra days at the end of the calendar year. And at times in the Jewish calendar, they added a full month to it to adjust. That's right. The Hebrew calendar adds an extra month to it seven times in a 19-year cycle. In a cycle of 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17 and 19 years, a whole entire extra month is added to the Hebrew calendar called Adar Bet, meaning Adar 2 or the second Adar. Two months are named Adar, thus occasionally giving them a 13-month year. And it's done for a very practical reason. 
Because had they used only lunar cycles to determine months and years and disregarded the solar cycle, the biblical feasts would soon begin to fall in the wrong seasons. Because after all, it is the cycle of the sun that controls our seasons, not the cycle of the moon. And because the biblical feasts were agricultural feasts based on agricultural growing seasons of the year, and certain first fruits of the harvest had to be offered at the temple according to the Torah law, what would happen if the festival of first fruits, for instance, that's a springtime festival that's supposed to occur in, uh, on, Nisan, on Nisan 16th, what if in time it found itself occurring in midsummer, or worse, in midwinter? In other words, it's inevitable that because lunar cycles and solar cycles don't line up, then according to the fixed calendar dates of the Torah, the seasons would be constantly moving around, changing, advancing at a rate of 11 days per year. So in our modern era, as in ancient times, the Jewish calendar still uses lunar cycles to determine Months, the months change precisely in tune with the moon, but the Jewish calendar also still observes the solar cycle, and so it adjusts their calendar about every three years to keep the two, the solar cycle and the lunar cycle, in the proper relationship, and that's exactly what they did in ancient biblical times. Bottom line, for all practical purposes, a biblical or a Jewish year is the same as a modern era year. There's no difference. There's no adjustments between the two needed. So we can use the year, all the year mentions in the Bible, just as they are. We do not have to alter them. Okay? Now, with all that, let's read 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings Chapter 6. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is on page 373. It was in the 480th year after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Shlomo's, Solomon's, reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is in the second, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of Adonai. The house which King Shlomo built for Adonai was 105 feet long, 35 feet wide, and 52 and one half feet high. The hall fronting the temple of the house was 35 feet long, the same as the width of the house itself, so that its 17 and a half foot width extended frontward from the house. Now the windows he made for the house were wide on the inside, narrow on the outside. And against the wall of the house he built an annex all the way around. It went all the way around the walls of the house including both the temple and the sanctuary. The lowest floor of the annex was eight and three quarters feet wide. The middle floor was ten and a half feet wide, the third floor twelve and a quarter feet wide, for he had made the outer part of the wall of the house step-shaped, so that the beams of the annex wouldn't have to be attached to the house walls. For the house, when under construction, was built of stone prepared at the quarry, so that no hammer, chisel, or iron tool of any kind was heard in the house while it was being built. Now the entrance to the lowest floor was on the south side of the house. A spiral staircase went up to the middle floor and on to the third. So he built the house and after finishing it, he put its roof on, cedar planks over beams. Each floor of the annex surrounding the house was eight and three quarters feet high and it was attached to the house with beams of cedar. Then this word of Adonai came to Shlomo. Concerning this house which you are building, 
if you will live according to my regulations, if you will follow my rulings and observe all my mitzvot commandments, and you will live by them, then I will establish with you my promise that I made to David your father. I will live in it among the people of Israel. I will not abandon my people Israel. So Shlomo finished building the house. The insides of the walls of the house he built with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house up to the joists of the ceiling, he covered them on the inside with wood, and he covered the floor of the house with boards of cypress. The 35-foot back portion of the house he built with boards of cedar from the floor to the joists and reserved this part of the house to be a sanctuary, the especially holy place. While the rest of the house, that is the temple in front, was 70 feet long. Now the cedar covering the house was carved with gourds and open flowers. All was cedar, no stone was visible. And in the inner part of the house he set up the sanctuary so that the ark for the covenant of Adonai could be placed there. This sanctuary was 35 feet long, wide, and high, and it was overlaid with pure gold. In front of it he set an altar which he covered with cedar. Solomon overlaid the interior of the house with pure gold, and he had chains of gold placed before the sanctuary, which itself he overlaid with gold. The entire house he overlaid with gold until it was completely covered with it. He also overlaid with gold the entire altar that belonged to the sanctuary. Inside the sanctuary, he made uh, two karuvim, two cherubs, two cherubim, of olive wood each 17 and a half feet high. Each of the two wings of one of the Kerovim was eight and three quarters feet long, so that the distance from the end of one wing to the end of the other was 17 and a half feet. Likewise, the wing spread of the other Keruv, cherub, was 17 and a half feet. Both cherubim were identical in shape and size. The height of the one cherub was 17 and a half feet, likewise that of the other, and he set the cherubim on the inner house. And the wings of the cherubim were stretched out, so that the wing of the one touched the wall, the wing of the other touched the other wall. Their wings touched each other in the middle of the house. He overlaid the karuvim with gold, and all around the walls of the house, both inside the sanctuary and outside, he carved figures of Karavim of palm trees and of open flowers. And he overlaid the floor of the house with gold, both inside the sanctuary and outside of it. Now, for the entrance to the sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood set within a five sided door frame. On the two olive wood doors, he carved figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid the doors with gold, forcing the gold into the shapes of the cherubim. Uh, cherubim, the cherubim, and palm trees as well. And for the entrance to the temple, he also made doorposts of olive wood set within a rectangular door frame, and two doors of cypress wood. The two leaves of the one door were folding, as were the other, as were two leaves of the other. On them he carved karuvim, palm trees, and open flowers, overlaying them with gold fitted to their carved work. He built the inner court with three rows of cut stone and a row of cedar beams. The foundation of the house of Adonai was laid in the fourth year in the month of Ziv, in the eleventh year in the month of Bul, which is the eighth month. All parts of the house were completed exactly as designed. Thus, he was seven years building it. Verse 2 tells us the basic size of the main structure of the temple. It is 60 cubits long by 20 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Now, most modern Bibles will convert cubits to feet. But this conversion process uh, produces some controversial numbers. The problem is that a cubit was not a standardized measurement. It could denote a certain length, 
in one society or nation that was different from another society or nation. Even more, it was common that each society observed a regular cubit and a royal cubit. The royal cubit was always a little bit longer than the regular cubit. A cubit was generally defined as the length from a man's fingertips to his elbow. So, the further back in time that we go, a cubit was more approximate than it was exact, but eventually a precise standard for a cubit was established on a nation-by-nation -nation basis. Now, there's a lot of disagreement over which cubit is being used in the building of Solomon's temple. I'm not going to get into that bait, b debate because there's no way for us to ever know for sure. In modern terms, the various cubits range from a little over 17 inches up to about 24 inches. And if we take a middle ground, let's say 20 inches, we find that the temple would be about 100 feet long, 33 feet wide, 50 feet high. The complete Jewish Bible, interestingly, has chosen to use the Egyptian royal cubit, which is 20 and a half inches. So, for the sake of simplicity, from here on, we're just going to use the complete Jewish Bible numbers. So what we instantly see is that the main temple building would be, um, I think, rather modest, about 3,675 square feet. Not all that huge. Now, the first interesting thing to note is that the new temple structure is exactly twice the size of the wilderness tabernacle that it's replacing. Thus we can know the tent was about 1,800 square feet. Pretty big for a tent. Now Exodus 26 says that the wilderness tabernacle was 30 by 10 cubits, Solomon's temple 60 by 20. The tabernacles, Holy of Holies, was 10 by 10. Solomon's temple, 20 by 20. The tabernacle's outer room, 20 by 10 cubits. The new temple, 40 by 20. So we can see that while the temple's much larger, the exact proportions of it remain the same. There is nothing wrong with this doubling of size. The Exodus measurements were this for the sacred tent, the Mishkan that had to be packed up and for travel, had to be hauled around with the Israelites out in the wilderness. The temple was a permanent structure, so its size isn't restricted by practicality. Now the term we're going to see throughout the story of the temple's construction is the house of Adonai, or the house of the Lord, or in Hebrew, Beit Yehoveh. And this, of course, reflected the common belief of the time that a god literally resided within the temple that his or her worshipers built for them. So the worshipers would bring their god all the comforts of life, soft couches to lie on, or the best food to eat, the highest grade of wine to drink, and even human women or men to consort with them. And of course, the Hebrew god Yehovah made it clear he doesn't reside in houses built by human hands. He lives in heaven. Isaiah 66, 1. Heaven is my throne, says Adonai. The earth is my footstool. What kind of a house could you build for me? What sort of place could you devise for my rest, he says. That's pretty straightforward. Even Solomon, who was putting out this incredible amount of his time in the kingdom's wealth to build this amazing building, well, he inherently knew that while more than 100 times in the scriptures, the Mishkan is indeed called God's dwelling place, the term is a euphemism. It's not literal. It was never meant to be literal. They knew that. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 8, which we haven't quite gotten to there yet, but will in a couple weeks, Solomon is recorded as saying in verses 27 through 30, 
But can God live on earth? Why, heaven itself, even the heaven of heavens can't contain you. How much more this house that I've built? Even so, I don't know, my God, pay attention to your servant's prayers and pleas. Listen to the cry and prayer that your servant is praying before you today. That your eyes will be open towards this house, night and day, towards the place concerning which you said, my name will be there. To listen to the prayer your servant will pr pray towards this place. Yes, listen to the pleas of your servant. Also that of your people Israel, when they pray towards this place, here in heaven where you live. And when you hear, forgive. Another interesting factor we get into, bef uh, before we get into the actual details of the temple, is its location. We don't find the location described here in 1 Kings. As a result, we'll find Bible commentators making all sorts of speculations of where it must have been, and many claiming that it was downhill somewhere from where the Temple Mount is located today. All that is needed to clear this up is to refer to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, which is the parallel account of this event, and you get the answer. In 2 Chronicles 3.1, Then Shlomo began to build the house of Adonai in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where Adonai had appeared to David his father. Provision had been made for this place, for this, at the place David had chosen, the threshing floor of Ornan the Yavusi, the Jebusite. Matter solved. Even more, we are fortunate that in our time, walls of Solomon's temple have been uncovered. And recently, an entire new section of the David Davidson Archaeological Garden inside the old city of Jerusalem has been opened which reveals walls from Solomon's era. And if you're going with us to Israel, you're going to see them. These are just below and adjacent to the Temple Mount. They were probably part of Solomon's palace complex. There is little doubt, except by the most extreme skeptic or those skeptics or those who are politically predisposed, that Solomon's temple was built right where the Temple Mount's located today. Well, the temple entrance, we're told, is from the east. So a priest walking in would be facing what direction? West. You're coming from the east, you better be facing west. That means the Ark of the Covenant was also facing east. Now, we've talked numerous times about the mysterious use of the direction east in the Bible as being important to the Lord. Note that when Yeshua returns, he's going to walk through what gate? The eastern gate of the old city. Verse 3 describes another structure. Some translators call it a porch, some a hall. Others, a vestibule, a portico. This structure was at the front of the main temple building on the east side, so that a person had to pass through this porch or this hall to gain entry into the temple proper. There are no doors described, no side walls, therefore it was probably didn't even have a ceiling. It might have, but it's not described. We're going to see some other structures that are attached to the main temple structure, Thus, we are going to wind up with the whole temple structure. So the area of the holy place and of the holy of holies is identified as the hechal, the hechal, to distinguish it from the other structures that, of the temple complex. And, and located in this hechal, verse 4 speaks about windows. These windows would have been very high up because these were tall structures attached to the exterior northern and southern walls of the hall. Thus, even though many translations, even including our complete Jewish Bibles, say that the windows were narrow on the outside, wide on the inside, this is the way that special portals were made on the defensive walls 
of, of, of walled cities. This is just a guess. And along with many other Bible teachers, I think this doesn't even make any sense. The description of the window construction is probably referring to the lattice work that covered those windows. There's no reason to make windows in the temple in a manner that would reduce light and airflow, nor would it be designed as a defensive position for soldiers who wouldn't even be allowed inside the holy place for any reason. The temple was not a fortress. Yet another temple complex structure is identified, and it's called the annex. Now the annex was built using cells, if you would, partitions. And they were probably built for storage, perhaps some used as a workspace for the Levites or the priests. And this annex encompassed three quarters of the exterior of this building. It was constructed on the west, north, and south sides of it. And this annex was built in a very unique way. It was built in a reverse step configuration. In other words, one would think that when building a multi-story structure that either all floors would be of the same dimensions or the lowest floor would be the widest, the next floor up a little less wide and so on. This was built so that the lowest floor was the narrowest, the next floor a little wider, the top floor the widest. And verse 6 explains that this was so that the temple walls, the call walls, wouldn't have to be defaced by having supporting beams for the annex structures stuck through them. So the walls of the Hekal were built seven cubits thick at the bottom. And at, then after five cubits of elevation, the wall became six cubits thick. Five more cubits of elevation, and the temple walls reduced to five cubits, finally down to four, so the western, northern, and southern walls were built like a step pyramid. This enabled the supporting beams for the annex to be laid upon the ledges that were created by these steps, rather than becoming a literal part, rather than being integrated into the temple structure. So the floor, the annex's floors were from lowest to highest, five, six, then seven cubits in width. And verse seven explains that quarry stones were used for the wall construction, but no iron chisel or tool was heard in the house, in the temple, while it was being built. And the sages explain that this was an extra measure of caution and sanctity that Solomon employed based on the principle that no iron tool was to be used on the stones for the altar. However, this prohibition didn't apply to the temple. So, while at the quarry site, iron tools were certainly used on the temple stones, they had to be made precisely there at the quarry. And then later they were transported to the temple building site. There they had to be fit together in a precise order. They had been so expertly made that they simply lay into their proper place without modification. After explaining in verse 8, that the entrance into the outer annex was from the outside. In other words, you didn't enter it from the inside of the temple to get into it. The ceiling now becomes the subject. The ceiling was built using multiple layers, much like the ceiling on the wilderness tabernacle. Highly decorated cedar planks were visible inside the temple, and they were attached to another layer of cedar planks that then acted as a temple roof. And when we get to verse 11, there is a sudden interruption in the narrative of the temple construction. Solomon is given a prophetic message from God, no doubt through a prophet. Now the sages say that this prophet was Haya the Shilonite, and this divine oracle carries a meaning that we all need to pay attention to. The Lord warns Shlomo that with all the care, all the expense, all the focus that he has been lavishing on this temple project, 
he needs to remember something important. It is that trusting God and following his Torah commandments is what will bring about the divine promise made to his father David. And that promise was that the Lord would dwell among his people Israel and would not abandon them. The implication is unmistakable. Yehovah is noticing that Solomon was, was beginning to count more and more on his industrious works, on his own merit, and he was spending his and his people's wealth in order to impress God. Sounding righteous, looking righteous, building a grand structure that Solomon would get the credit for, requiring thousands of his citizens to sacrifice their personal time, skills, and money for his grand plan. How much of this was really about God? How much was about Solomon becoming envied and famous the world over? But even more, after spending all this time and effort, would Solomon now expect that this is what would induce Yehovah to continue the Davidic dynasty and favor Shlomo and Israel? How could God possibly refuse to do so after Solomon has spent so much energy for God's house? See, this is what too many of us do subconsciously. We write big checks. We come to our places of worship every time they open the doors. We teach a Sunday school class for years. We volunteer for mission trips. We wear the biggest, most expensive crosses or stars of David around our necks. Our homes are filled with biblical icons everywhere. We plaster our cars with religious bumper stickers. We go to Israel regularly. And we appear to be the most godly, pious person on the block. But are we? What's our true motive for doing these things? The Lord measures us by our faith and our trust in Him. He also measures us by our humility before Him and by our grateful obedience with spirit-led submission to his timeless and immutable regulations and commandments. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, Shmuel, Samuel said, Does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings as in, and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice, heeding orders than the fat of rams. In one sense, this amazing temple was built as the authorized location for sacrifice and atonement, but in that, that sense it was only needed because God's people shunned obedience and instead sinned. Was Solomon doing something wrong in straining so mightily to build for God this beautiful edifice? No. Are we doing something wrong by giving it till it hurts, or by serving every hour that we're able, or by going on mission trips, or visiting Israel as often as we can to show our support for them? No. The question is, what do we expect from God in return for our efforts and behavior? What do you want back? Can we substitute never-ending works, pious behavior for trust in Him, in His Son, in His written word? Can we make up for our sins by means of our good deeds and our tireless work? The answer is no to all of that as well. I've known a number of believers who daily live a less than upright lifestyle. 
But then they go on a mission trip for a few days, speak glowingly of the Lord over and over to scores or maybe hundreds of people. They hand out tracts, perhaps give out food, maybe medical care. They come back home, and then they return to that same questionable lifestyle. I've also known many fo folks who give and give and give in innumerable ways and then are perplexed and some bitter when something bad happens to them that they think shouldn't have happened. Because deep down, they thought their activities amounted to the purchase of divine protection. Immunity, maybe, from trouble. You know, they're doing their part. God, how come you didn't do your part? I did all this for you, God. So why won't you do what I think you ought to do and keep me healthy and prosperous? Thought we had a deal. See, but God looks at the heart. And when he looked at Solomon, he saw a little less than pure motives at work. And of course, as we continue our study of the book of Kings, we're going to watch Solomon slide into idolatry, all manner of detestable behavior, all the while indignantly denying it and even doing some of it in the name of God. The next several verses resume with temple construction as concerns the interior of the temple and without getting into too much detail we can just say that enormous quantities of gold were used and a lot of ornamentation was employed. The cedar wood paneling was used mostly as an underlayment to cover the stone walls so that gold sheeting could be attached to it. The idea was that beautiful designs would be expertly carved into the wood paneling. The paneling would then be attached to the stone structure to fully cover over it. Then a thin gold leaf would be carefully applied to entirely cover the walls as it followed the delicate contours of the, of the panels, panelings, carvings. We're going to continue with this next week. Please rise. <laughs>